He was once set to be remembered as a great leader in the French army, to be best known for his contribution in the Hundred Years' War and a victory over the British. He was said to have been a man of a pure soul, a pious man, who earned the favour of his peers, including the close companionship of none other than Joan of Arc. He would earn the respected title of the Marshal of France and would retire from his military career as a wealthy man. So how is it that Gilles de Ray would become a murderer of innocent children and a supposed summoner of demons? From prestigious military commander to a dabbler of the occult, what caused Gilles de Ray to fall from grace? Before I go any further with the video, I think it's important to note that while I won't be using any graphic images, the nature of Gilles de Ray's crimes are quite diabolical. Therefore, viewer discretion is advised. Gilles de Ray was born in September 1405 and was said to be a very intelligent child, demonstrating an ability to speak fluent Latin and showing a flair for education. Unfortunately, the death of his father and mother when he was just 15 years old would see him and his younger brother become taken in by their grandfather. Their grandfather, though, seemed more interested in arranging marriages for his grandchildren and enhancing their fortune, attempting to hook them up with heiresses in Normandy. By 1420, he would be successful and would see de Ray married into another wealthy family. De Ray would have a very successful and active military career, where he was praised with many accomplishments. In 1425, for example, he took prisoner the English Captain Blackburn at the Battle of Chateau de Loup. Two years later, in the years 1425 to 1435, de Ray served as commander in the Royal Army and was again recognised for his distinct characteristics of bravery during his service in the Hundred Years' War. In 1429, he became a companion of Joan of Arc and would fight alongside her in a few campaigns against the English, including the Siege of Orleans. In this same year, he was awarded the prestigious title of the Marshal of France, a distinction allocated to generals for exceptional achievements. So what went so wrong? By 1434, de Ray had withdrew himself from the military and from the public eye in order to pursue his own interests. These interests lay in production, more specifically the production of theatrical spectacles which he would host in the Chapel of the Holy Innocents a chapel in which he had constructed himself. The play in which he planned to have performed would consist of more than 20,000 lines of verse, which in turn required 140 speaking parts and over 500 extras. As you can imagine, setting this all up and financing all that was required was mighty costly, and it would drive the rate to almost certain bankruptcy. Due to this, he began selling off many of his properties. Soon. He had sold all of his estates, and would retain only two castles. On May 8th in 1435, de Ray would achieve his goal and the play was performed, though not parsimoniously. 600 costumes were made, worn once, and then thrown away, only to be reconstructed again for subsequent performances. Food and drink were made readily available to the spectators, all of which was paid in full out of de Ray's own pocket. His family members grew concerned with his sumptuous appetites. They appealed to the Pope to disavow the chapel in which de Ray had built in order to discredit it, but the Pope refused. And so his family went to the King to raise their concerns, where a royal edict was proclaimed. Through a string of political and legal affairs, de Ray was eventually denounced and forbidden to sell any more property, which meant he was unable to fund his hobby. No one in France was allowed to legally enter a contract with him, and those in command of his remaining castles were forbidden from selling them. With no way of making money, now that he couldn't legally enter a contract with anyone, de Ray began to borrow money. Given that he was desperate to fill this seemingly large void in his life that could only be filled with the extravagance from his theatrical shows, it could certainly be his motivation for turning to the occult. He was desperate for money, desperate to find a way in which to fund his luxurious lifestyle. According to the testimony from his trial from a priest named Blanchet, de Ray sent out Blanchet to find anyone who knew about alchemy as well as the summoning of demons. 
Blanchet was able to find a cleric named Francois Prelati in Florence and persuaded him to return with him to France so that he might teach De Ray in the ways of the occult. Using books provided to him by Prelati, De Ray chose to begin experimentation with the occult in the lower hall of his castle, attempting to summon a demon named Baron. De Ray was said to have failed several times with the summoning until Prelati explained that Baron first required an offering in order to achieve the attention of the demon and warrant a visit from him. This offering would come in the body parts of children. In his confession, De Ray mentioned that the first assaults on children occurred in the spring of 1432 and the spring of 1433. There are quite a few twisted accounts, though few records to actually back any of them up, other than his confession. In one account, he ordered the killing of several children after having lured them to one of his properties in Mashkal before sodomizing them. Whether this was part of his deal with the demon baron, or for the sake of his own deviancy or insanity, is unknown. Like the witch trials, there are many who believe that the involvement of the so-called demon baron was a politically charged statement that De Ray was forced to confess to. One of the first documented cases of child snatching by De Ray is a 12-year-old boy named Judon, an apprentice to a furrier. In fact, it was De Ray's cousins who took the boy and claimed that they were using him for an errand. When the furrier inquired as to where his apprentice was, De Ray's cousins played ignorant, claiming he had been carried off by thieves. Modern biographer Jean Bendetti claims that the boy in question was pampered and dressed in better clothes than he had ever known. He was given a large meal and was subject to heavy drinking. The boy was then taken to an upper room, to which only De Ray's close circle were privy to. There, the boy would realise he would die, and it was this initial shock that served as a source of pleasure to De Ray. De Ray's servant Poitou was an accomplice of his many crimes and testified that his master had stripped the child naked and hung him with ropes from a hook to prevent the child from moving around. He then masturbated on the child. In the future assaults, he would fondle the boy's testicles. It should also be noted that many of De Ray's victims were male. When the victims were released from their restraints, De Ray would comfort the child and seek to assure them that the whole thing was just some sort of prank. Upon receiving the child's understanding, he would kill the child or have one of his close circle do it, usually via decapitation or by the slitting of the throat. Other times he would disembowel them entirely or break their necks with a stick. A short, thick and double-edged sword called a brahma was often kept on hand be used as the murder weapon. In his own confession, De Ray testified that he would kiss the children once they were dead, and that those who had the most handsome heads would be held up to admire. He would then take delight in cutting open their bodies and staring in wonder at the sight of their inner organs. He also claimed that when the children were dying, he would sit on their stomachs and took pleasure in watching them die, sometimes even laughing. Poitou testifies that he and the others of the inner circle of De Ray had burned the bodies in the fireplace in De Ray's room. This was done piece by piece, so as to minimise the stench that would have surely risen suspicion. The ashes of the bodies were thrown into the cesspit, the moat, or other non-disclosed hiding places. It's such a sickly thing to imagine, but one can only wonder why De Ray had taken this so far. It must be asked again whether this was a form of his own insanity, or whether he was indeed receiving some form of gratification, whether sexual or otherwise, from these gruesome acts. If you recall, the cleric Prelati informed De Ray that the demon baron would need the body parts of children in order for a deal to be conceived, but he doesn't appear to state anything of the sort in which De Ray was eventually said to confess to. Had De Ray gotten carried away? sinking further and further into a darker and sicker mindset? I suppose one will never know. On May 15th in 1440, De Ray was audacious enough to kidnap a cleric during a dispute, but the act prompted an investigation by the Bishop of Nantes in which he was said to find evidence of De Ray's debauchery. De Ray and his inner circle were arrested later that year on the accounts of both murder and heresy, 
DeRay admitted to the charge on the 21st of October, after judges decided that there were adequate grounds in which to establish his guilt, based on the several witness testimonies. It should be noted that the peasants of the neighbouring villages had began to make accusations that their children did not return home after they had entered DeRay's castle when they were out begging for food. DeRay's accomplices were also said to incriminate him absolutely by providing graphic descriptions of what they had all done to these children, some of which were omitted from the record given that they were just too vivid for the court to read. We don't know how many victims DeRay took given that he'd burned most of the bodies, with the exception of some bodies found at Mashkul, though it's unclear if these were victims of DeRay, or another killer, or a series of killers. DeRay did claim that the age of his victims ranged from 6 to 18 years old, some of which were girls, but for the most part, were boys. Jules DeRay and his accomplices were naturally sentenced to death. On the morning of the 26th of October, in 1440, they were all hung. De Ray's request to be buried within the church was granted, but the bodies of his accomplices were consumed by flames after their hanging. There has since been doubts as to the guilt of De Ray, given that physical evidence condemning him was hardly present. A counter-argument has since been suggested that De Ray was a victim of a plot by the Catholic Church or the French state. This comes about mainly because the Duke of Brittany, who was given the authority to prosecute DeRay, would go on to receive all the titles to DeRay's lands. Much like in witch trials, many women were tortured to confess to the crime of witchcraft by accusers who wanted their land, even though they were likely not witches at all, and only said so to make the pain of the torture stop. The idea is that DeRay was threatened with the same method, and wanted to avoid the torture altogether. He realised that his name would be tarnished anyway, and even if he tried to resist the torture, he would surely give in eventually. 20th century occultist Alistair Crowley claimed that DeRay was simply in the pursuit of knowledge. Meanwhile, anthropologist and folklorist Margaret Murray stated DeRay was actually a witch and a supporter of a fertility cult that centred around the pagan goddess Diana. However, most historians reject both of these ideas and agree that he was guilty of the crimes committed, though the motivations for these crimes remains a case for dispute. But what did you think about Gilles de Ray? Was he as ghastly and sick as the accounts make him sound? Or was this all a ruse by the French government in order to obtain his lands? As always guys, if you've enjoyed this video, then do give the video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And let me know in the comments below who you'd like to see in the next video of the Occult History series. Until the next time guys.